started here. I put some questions down there for you to ponder. Questions that have to do with the uh, philosophy of education. And each of you has one of those. Some of you may have written them out. I know we have our students do that at Bethany as part of their education. But even if you're not philosophical, if you're seated with hands, I mean, there's still these assumptions that guide your teaching, right? And now it's summertime, so we sit back, we look at the lighthouse, we relax, and we ponder our philosophy. Um, what, one question then is, does, does objectivity require neutrality? Uh, I think sometimes we, we expect that to be objective, you can't take sides, right? You have to be neutral. Is that true? The other question there kind of sees it from the other angle. It says, might neutrality in some instances inhibit objectivity just as much as partisanship can in other instances? So that's something to think about as well. And since it's philosophy, I can't tell the answer. But I will <laughs> tell you that when I go to the doctor, I'm going to a medically trained professional, and I don't want that physician to be objective. When it comes down to my life with the bacteria, I want the doctor to be on my side. <laughs> right? So, so, you know, even in things like medical science, where you think, uh, that's objective, you know, like social science or something like that, right? Um, you, you, you kind of have to wonder about this neutrality idea. Sometimes it's okay to make sense. And so, as we look at these different tales from America's past, and as we look at them from two different perspectives, you might want to take sides, and you might want to say, I like version A, or I like version B. Or you might want to say, I like some things from both and I want to mix them or find a happy medium. Don't feel like mixing them and finding a happy medium, medium is always the best answer. But don't feel like taking version A or, or version B by itself is always the best answer either. The point is, you and through you, your students, have to sort these things out to figure out <coughs> what, what does it really take to get the knowledge and understanding of the receiver. So, there's the philosophy and now we go into the neighborhood. Page three. Here I've got a teacher's guide on two ways to tell the tale about women's rights in the Atlantic world during the age of enlightenment. I understand we're supposed to deal with foreign relations and diplomacy and that sort of thing uh, today. The next topic on the XYZ affair and so forth will will fit that in a more textbook obvious sort of way. This is kind of a non-traditional entrance into the topic, but I think it will help as well. And what I've got then, version A and version B, two outlines of background information, and each one is, is kind of slanted, if you will, toward a particular perspective. I'd like to read through version A with you now, and as we go through those points, think about your own past teaching experiences. Think about the textbooks that you use, the worksheets that you distribute. Do they fit version A? Are there, are there things that you say, yep, I recognize that? Or are there things in version A that you think, well, this is weird, that goes against the grain? And then we might, uh, share some of your thoughts at the end of this. So, version A, something like this. Women are second-class citizens. Men have subjugated women for centuries. The Enlightenment ideals of personal liberties and individual rights were developed primarily by and for men, more specifically white men. So you think of, you know, someone like Jefferson, for example. The American Revolution was conservative with respect to gender relations, just as with race. So just as slaves were not emancipated, at least not throughout all of the colonies, though in uh, they gradually were, uh, so also the gender relations. Neither the Declaration of Independence nor the U.S. Constitution affirmed women as full citizens. States typically did not permit women to own property, to file for divorce, or to vote. A common law notion of coverture defined women as daughters or wives, legal <coughs> independence, and subject to fathers or husbands. Mary Wollstonecraft's a vindication of the rights of women boldly applied enlightenment individualism to women, but women would not receive property rights in America until the 1840s, nor the vote until 1920, and so she's kind of the exception that proves the rule, right? The philosophy that no one else took seriously. The John and Abigail Adams correspondence reveals the limits of political savvy women. Abigail could entertain the idea of women being emancipated through the revolution, but John would remind her of her of the fairer sex proper sphere. Raise your hand if you're familiar with that exchange. Have you does that show up as a as a source document in your curriculum? I think it's a pretty common one. Yep. And so it was that the revolution did not correct the historic injustices by which men denied women their rightful status as equals. But women would not give up trying. What Abigail Adams and Mary Wollstonecraft began in the 1700s would continue under Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott. Uh, and Francis Willard 
in the 1800s, followed by Margaret Sanger and Betty Frieda in the 1900s, and then in 2008, a woman would merely become president. And so, how many of you, as you look at version A, say, that sounds familiar? I see strains of that in my material. I'm seeing lots of testicles. Does anyone want to make a comment or give an example of how this fits? Yeah. 